every woman out there is vulnerable. No matter how many years you've worked on there, there's always the not knowing. That is the element of fear of there could be, you could be getting in the car of a serial killer and you don't know. You have to shut off to being scared to your fears, you know, because if you're going to be scared of every single car you get in, you're never going to get in a car. I had to accept that risk, I had to deal with it, I had to do what I had to do because I needed the next fix. Every night, a group of 30 women worked the streets of this small British town. They were addicts, risking their lives for the money to feed their habit. They were isolated, ignored and invisible until a serial killer started looking for victims. What followed was the fastest killing spree in British criminal history. This was Ipswich in the winter of 2006. Police hunting the killer of a prostitute have made another disturbing discovery. They found a second young the woman's body. The discovery of a third body on the edge of the street. Third body. The woman was in her 20s. The detectives towards the frightening conclusion that they're searching for a serial killer. The word went out Once from the police today to prostitutes and the public alike. Stay off the streets of Ipswich. There is an underground life to every single town in the entire UK. The dark, seeded, squalid little part of the town you don't want to know, that you know is there, but you just don't want to admit it's there. There is a piece of Ipswich people wish not to notice. This is um, West End Road. Um, which is one of what I would class as the main roads of the red light district. Um, I used to walk up here over night time, you know, short skirts, you know, trying to look like a worker girl. The sort of guys that come see me are your next door neighbours, the man across the street, the guy that you see when you're at work, the young lad that owns a car down the street washing it every Saturday, rich men in nice cars, middle-aged men in a Ford Focus. I found myself in the, um, the red light district of Ipswich one night about one hour after the conclusion of a relationship. And within about half an hour I just actually got in the car and drove to Ipswich to the red light district, which I was aware of. The sexual menu on offer was um, kind of sex and oral around about £30, £40, pounds, you know, with condoms. That was around about what it was. £40? Pound. 40, 50 pounds for sex, because you know that 40 is one of each one bit of heroin, one bit of crack cocaine. It was quite busy actually before everything started happening, and the police reckoned there was 30 girls out there all together. The first night I'd done it, I got out the car, bottled out, but the second time I'd had heroin, and the next car I stopped, I got in it and just got on with it. I'd never done anything like that in my life before. Never thought I would, but I did. I have worked this road for nearly eight years, seven and a half years. The public's view of us working girls was never very high. People chose to ignore us. They knew it was going on, just didn't want to accept it was in their town. It was an arrangement that suited everyone, until one by one, the working girls of Ipswich began to disappear. The first was Tanya Nickel. She was 19. Tanya's mother called the police to report her daughter missing on November the 1st. She told them that two nights earlier, Tanya had gone out to work and hadn't come home. She hadn't called to explain, and she wasn't answering her phone. And Tanya always called in. We had contact from Tanya's mum, who told us that Tanya was missing and the circumstances were unusual. We knew that she used her phone regularly. She was often in contact with friends, family. But the mobile phone dropped off the network, if you like. It sort of stopped, stopped being registered. Um, and that indicated to us that something critical had happened. On the 
night of October the 30th, Tanya had caught the bus to work in the red light district. She was caught on CCTV, passing a supermarket just after 11. A short time later, the cameras of an office building filmed the last recorded sighting. We found some footage which showed Tanya she had been approached by a vehicle. You could see this very grainy figure move around the front of the car. She appears to have some kind of conversation and then the camera pans away. Two weeks later, police in Ipswich received another call about a 25-year-old woman called Gemma Adams. It was her boyfriend. He said Gemma was missing too. The first that we knew that Gemma had gone missing was a knock at the door at about half past three, four o'clock in the morning. Are you the father of Gemma Adams? Yes, I am. Do you know where she is? We think she's gone missing. She's been reported missing. But that was the first time that we knew that she was actually working the streets like that. Missing for two days. Both prostitutes two both and disappeared. A slim build. In Ipswich, the police investigation was already escalating. There were unusual and disturbing similarities in the way the two women had disappeared from the red light district. On the night of November the 14th, Gemma was caught on camera at 20 past 11. Then at two minutes to midnight, like Tanya, the signal of her mobile phone simply vanished from the network. Gemma, for me, was when alarm bells started ringing because Gemma was never the sort of person that would go anywhere and not tell no one. That was when things started not feeling right. It was rather wet. All the fields were in flood for days upon days. That actual morning was the first morning in weeks where I could actually get around without sinking up to my knees in mud. I was walking along the brook, checking to make sure there was no blockages anywhere, when I suddenly noticed two smooth, round objects sticking out of the surface of the water. I thought to myself, well, somebody's put a dummy into the brook, a mannequin. When I noticed the flowing hair and a gold earring and suddenly realised from that point that I had actually found a female body. We heard via my mobile telephone that a body had been discovered. We didn't know at that time whether it was Tanya or whether it was Gemma. We then heard that it was probably not Tanya and um, it was confirmed that it was Gemma. Feisty is probably the best word. She was a strong character as well, quite stubborn. If you told her that white was white, she'd sometimes argue that it was black. I thought that she would either be a nurse or a police woman. But she actually ended up in car insurance. She wore a lovely dark blue pinstripe suit and I used to drop her off in the morning. And to see her walking into work made me feel very proud. And then suddenly she lost the job. We had a knock on the door and it was the police. And they said the boyfriend had been arrested. Gemma was at the police station as well and she'd been implicated in a theft. And, by the way, were we aware that she had a habit? He didn't even really understand what he meant by a habit. And he said that she was a, a, a heroin addict. Gemma was a very private person. And the last thing in the world that she would have wanted was for us to find out what she was doing. Those girls should never have been where they were. 
They should never have been out on the street. None of them should. I was called by police to say that they discovered a young woman dumped in water naked. Probably in a year, I would be involved in about 10 or so suspicious death cases, street fights, pub fights, domestic killings, so husband or wife killing the other partner. In my experience, the majority of murders involving prostitutes would have obvious levels of violence very violent stabbing. Strangulation would be common, indeed quite extreme levels of violence. As the duty forensic pathologist in Suffolk, Dr Carey's task was to search for scientific evidence of Gemma's killer. But the fast-flowing brook had covered the murderer's tracks, washing away any trace of DNA. And all the post-mortem could reveal was that some sort of suffocation seemed likely. You're really dealing with something like interference with the mechanics of breathing, something stopping you breathing in normally. That could be smothering, or it could be compression of the neck, or it could be a combination of the two. And anyone who was under the influence of drugs would be much more vulnerable than someone normally alert and conscious. After they retrieved Gemma's body from the river, it was just like a circus. There was police vans, police cars, helicopters, reporters, everything all over the place. Initially, the search dogs and the normal police started searching the woods all the way around the lakes, up and down the stream, and then the divers came in. While police searched the brook for evidence of Gemma's killer, the hunt for missing Tanya Nickel intensified. Rubbish dumps were searched for her clothing. At an Ipswich Town football match, leaflets were handed out to fans, and in the streets of the red light district around the stadium, police stepped up their stop and search patrols. Immediately, the fears were heightened in respect of Tanya. The fact that one of the missing women has been found dead, it really redoubled their efforts to try and find out what had happened. There'd been no sign of Tanya for more than a month. It was just so surreal. You never imagine it will be someone you know. I always viewed it that Tanya was a more important part of my life than I was of hers, but we were probably mutual support to each other. We used to meet up and have breakfast on a Friday. She never, ever admitted to me she'd got any sort of problem. I didn't know about the fact that she was actually working in the red light district, and I certainly didn't know she was a drug addict. It was almost as if there were two very, very separate people. There was Tanya, who was the nice girl, who was friendly and outgoing, who had all the sort of perhaps unachievable dreams that lots of people had. We'd get ourselves a nice car and a boat, and I could get the hairdressing salon that I've always wanted. And then the person who would use drugs, the person who would get into a stranger's car. That was when I really became fearful for Tanya. There was that gnawing feeling that it's only a matter of time now before the person who's, who's probably my best friend in the world is found. Six days after Gemma's body was found, the intensive investigation at the site had turned up nothing. The police divers had just one last stretch of the brook to search. The whole area was shut off. The only person allowed down the lake, apart from the police, was myself. It was like that day in, day out, from early morning right up till last light. They were just searching the whole area for anything. And eventually got to Tanya. I got a phone call from one of the search supervisors to say that they'd found another body and immediately just knew that it was Tanya. The Suffolk Constabulary is one of the smallest forces in the country, quiet county. We have about six murders a year, six or seven. Um, we've now got two 
linked together that have occurred within a very short space of time, both of the women having gone missing from the same area, and immediately we're starting to think the same offender is responsible for this. The modus operandi of whoever was involved in these killings appeared to be very similar. They were dumped locally, they were dumped naked, there was some sort of interference with the mechanics of breathing, and of course they were both uh, using hard drugs, and indeed there was evidence of hard drugs actually being in their bodies at the time of death. I wondered if we might be on the edge of something quite exceptional. That this could be the beginning of a serial killing spree. What I would say to women who feel that they still have to go out and work as prostitutes, we keep is that they need to make sure that they whether any look after themselves and they look after each other. We haven't got a murder scene in this They let others know where they're going. Me. In the first week of December 2006, two women in Ipswich were murdered. This small market town was facing the extraordinary reality that a killer was at work on its streets. At least once Tanya was found, there was no doubt about what had happened. You had to view it as someone was on a culling mission or something. My worst thoughts, you know, I'm never going to get to talk to her again. Just felt I'd been robbed. To know that I've had friends like that, you know, and that they're gone, it's just very hard to comprehend. We knew that something serious is going on. We all tried to keep an eye on each other. The main thing we all kept telling each other, which was weird, was just keep an eye on what time you saw me. Nothing like this has ever happened, see, in Ipswich. Prostitutes, they're young and they very vulnerable and impressionable. Where's the family? I've known oh, some many years. The little ones? Yeah. I warned them all what you know, I thought they should be doing and perhaps they shouldn't be out. And there was a sense of very much worry, I think, and who was going to be next or where it was going to happen, you know, and what they were going to find. We was following it from the start because we knew girls in that situation are killed all the time but it was so hard to get anybody to listen. Towards the very end of the 90s, start of the millennium, crack started to invade Ipswich on quite a large scale. The dealers would turn up at every social housing development, blocks of flats, hostels. Thursday night used to be a big one because it was the really cheap night at the nightclubs. They knew they had a lot of the right client group. I was around 15, 14, 15, 16, you know, I was at, what I'd say, a very naive age, you know, and, like, I wanted to be big, I wanted to put this front on that I was a girl you didn't want to mess with, and, you know, it was, I was just given to me, you know. They'd usually start off by handing out spliffs. Sometimes they'd let them know what was in it, sometimes they wouldn't. I actually had a man behind me yell at me. He just said, excuse me, love, have you tried crack before? And I said, no, he says, well, come with me, I'll give you some for free. So... I was working for a large hostel at the time. We were doing everything we could to keep them out of the building, to keep them away from our young people. It was always either given away for free or um, given away for services rendered. I thought I was going to die. The first time I tried heroin and crack cocaine, I thought I was going to die. No sooner had I tried it, the next day, I was buying heroin with my birthday money. I was 15, I was hooked by my birthday. About 2004, it had reached a tipping point. Masses of kids just lost to it completely. And everybody from the ground up, all in denial about what's going on all around them. There was one teenager, lost to a crack addiction, who had since turned her life around. She'd come off the drug. She'd left the town. She hadn't worked the streets for months. But the day after Gemma Adams' body was found, she caught a train back to Ipswich and disappeared. Her name 
was Annalee Alderton. You never quite recover, you just learn to cope. You come to terms with the fact that your little sister's dead. Then you have to come to terms with the fact that your little sister was murdered. I used to tease her that some people stick their hand in the fire and learn not to stick their hand in the fire. And she was the sort of person who'd stick her hand in the fire and say, No! I can beat fire! She was always a little performer, very opposite to me. I was always quite quiet, I was reserved. When she was a tiny little four-year-old girl, the dog barked and growled at her, so she stuck her fist in its mouth. She was totally fearless, really intense, and brilliant. Tom and Anna Lee grew up in Ipswich. Their parents divorced when Anna Lee was four, and she later moved with her mother to Cyprus. At 14, she came back to live with her father. It was the late 1990s, about the time her brother Tom first saw evidence that crack dealers were targeting the town. When I was young, Ipswich was a very strong, liberal, happy little town. It was a very nice place to grow up. Crack was something you saw on the telly, and you'd laugh at the concept because we're not South Central LA. My sister thought she was returning to the Ipswich of her youth, and I think she was taken by surprise a lot by just how aggressive it had become. Six months after her return, Tom and Annalee's father was diagnosed with cancer. As my dad's death got closer and his health deteriorated, she got more and more desperate. Then he died and she went off the rails completely. By Saturday the 9th of December, police in Ipswich had no murder site, no weapon, no DNA. What they did have was a growing list of the punters and curb crawlers who cruised the red light district. Most nights, about 30 women catered to three or four punters each. The police now warned all of them to expect a knock on the door. We were appealing for men who were using women as prostitutes in that area to come forward. There appeared to be no real signs of struggle. There hadn't been a fight. Is this somebody who knows the victims, who they know? Uh, because they're confident to get into the car with him, um, they feel comfortable with him. The police came to my home on several occasions. I phoned in to let them know what I knew about how the girls worked, where they went, where they did their transactions. I'd probably done more research on the area than anyone's ever done. My whole house was covered in images from the work I was doing and words I'd written about that. It may have looked, and looked to the police or anyone else, any outsider, that I was sort of obsessed by that scene, which in a way I was. My knowledge made me think the killer was someone who knew the area inside out, someone closely linked to those girls who they would have already trusted and not been afraid to spend time with. You just constantly have to be ready to pounce. You have to be ready to act. I've had my bag snatched from me. I've been pushed in the river and I've been taken to hospital because so I got beaten up with a rock. The first I heard about violence was a year into it when one of the girls got attacked and I got attacked about a week later. I think some of it is power for a punter, really, to be honest. They like to dominate situations, you know, they're the ones in control, they're the ones that are paying you. If someone wanted to kill me, they could have. Because they're paying, you know, you're doing what a client wants and sometimes there are men out there that the power gets too much for. Tom had last seen his sister Anna Lee the day she caught the train to Ipswich. By Sunday the 10th of December, seven days later, he still had no idea she'd disappeared. He thought, like everyone else, that she was safe because she'd escaped that life. I was volunteering in Ipswich, working for a drop-in centre. At the time when her crack habit was first developing, she'd dye her hair a very platinum blonde, 
Her body language used to change. I guess it helped separate and compartmentalise her life. She'd put on a mask and a disguise to do it. She wasn't really a prostitute. She was a clipper. They'd go out and they'd be given some drugs and then they'd have to pay for it. When she was walking the street, she wasn't thinking, right, I'm going to have sex for money. She didn't, right, I'm going to get the money, I'm going to run. Occasionally, she would end up in a circumstance where she couldn't get away and had to go free with it. And then, to some extent, she'd done the worst thing she could possibly imagine anybody doing, so she had no barriers left to cross. Our relationship had become very strained. You'd like to think that because we came from the same household, because we were so close, that somehow we'd be able to draw our paths back together again. But it just got so divergent, all you could really do is hang on to some semblance of, of what we had. On Sunday the 10th of December, two days after Tanya Nicol was found, a third body was discovered. Her identity shocked everyone. Anna Lee wasn't on our radar at all, uh, understandably so. She hadn't been reported missing. You know, there was nothing for us to be concerned about. And for that to actually come in, a third body, I mean, real feeling in the pit of your stomach. We've now got three women's bodies found in rural locations within an eight-day period. You start to question what's going to happen next. Annalee's body was discovered across the River Orwell from Ipswich, near a village on the estuary. Like the others, she had been asphyxiated. On that day, of course, the road was cordoned off, so there was no traffic. It was eerily quiet because of that. You can see uh, that the undergrowth uh, is moderately dense, but it's still possible to get through. Although the site was clearly visible from the road, it wasn't apparent until he got a bit nearer. You could see that the body was not only naked, but posed in this crucifix position. Anna Lee was the first victim the killer had left on dry land. It meant the first real prospect of recovering DNA from the forensic evidence. In two or three days, the laboratory would have an answer. One fact was known already. Annalie was pregnant when she was killed. Three months before the murders began, she had started a new life. In some ways, it's the first time we'd seen her real self for years. It really was the start of a bright new future. Anna Lee was 24. She had come off crack. She was going to college every day. She looked and dressed like the person she was before she became an addict. I guess I'll never really know for sure. But I think the catalyst was Gemma Adams. My sister took her death really, really hard. She could never really cope with her life being out of control. She dyed her hair again, readopted her street persona. She left and said goodbye, and that was the last we saw of her. Soon after her death, police released CCTV images of Anna Lee's last journey. I'd seen her four hours before those pictures were taken. But I remember the smiley, dark-haired, doing well at college, um, normal Annie that had arrived at my mum's house that day. She left on the train as someone we hadn't seen for ages. <laughs> It's the way she'll always be remembered in the public eye. There was just a small 
one day relapse. She just put the mask back on for one more day and it went wrong. I spoke to a lady last night, a prostitute, who said that she had seen Anna Lee's around about the time she was missing, getting into a dark blue BMW. Why have you not made a direct appeal? Can you tell us anything more about the deaths of the person? It, it, might, it might be a local punter, it might be somebody from outside. Oh, well, well done. Gentlemen, the back now. Thank you for crying to be news. Uh, the killer or killers could well be watching this. Do you have a message for them? Clearly, we had a serial killer whose activity was escalating to such a stage. It was just absolutely extraordinary. We were caught within the middle of that maelstrom and trying to keep control of the investigation. The pressure on Suffolk police was intensifying by the day. A month before the murders began, they had come near the bottom in a survey assessing each force's ability to handle a major criminal incident. Now, someone in Ipswich was on a killing spree, and, incredibly, the women he was hunting were still working the streets. Despite the dangers, why, why well, have you decided to come out tonight? Because I need the money. I need the money. We'd already got three murders from their community. I'm not sure what starker warning there can be. Our message was clear, stay off the streets, it's not safe. We all knew there was someone out there. It was just an air of panic, really. Knowing it could be the next car I get into is what scares you the most. I needed heroin and I needed crack cocaine and I had to go out in the street. I tried stealing during the day and got cautioned for it. So there, I clearly had to go out at work at night. I tried another avenue. I'm not a good thief, you know, I was a good working girl. Then, the day after Anna Lee's body was found, police in Ipswich called another press conference. It was Monday, the 11th of December. With the eyes of the world on them, they announced that two more women were now reported missing. Murder of Gemma Adams, Tanya Nicholl, and now our third victim. We are concerned for their welfare and making urgent inquiries to locate them. I would ask either of the girls themselves or anyone with information as to their whereabouts to contact the police immediately. Monday the 11th of December 2006 was the day Ipswich knew without doubt that a serial killer was targeting the town. Over the weekend, a third victim had been discovered and two more women were now missing. CCTV cameras in the high street had caught the last sighting of 29-year-old Annette Nichols shopping in the town centre. And just hours after Annette went missing, another woman disappeared. She was 24-year-old Paula Clonell. An interview conducted with her hours before she vanished was now playing on every bulletin. Once again, the dead will and the public the alike. I need Stay the money. The of I need the money. Yeah, that is scary. I can remember can hearing this voice. And this voice was very familiar to me, and I thought, that's Paula, she's alive, they found her. That has made me a bit wary about getting into cars, you know? But presumably you, you will do that tonight? Well, probably. Have you noticed that there's fewer men around? And then it said this was filmed two or three days before she went missing. A bit of that moment when I was doing the washing up, and I just heard the voice, and I was like, that's Paula. She didn't know where I lived, what my phone number was. I'd done it to protect my own family. I have three young children, and I didn't want them to see Auntie Paula the way she was. It was heartbreaking in a way, because that's my little sister, you know? And you don't want her to be in any danger. And you do just want to pull her into your house and say, look, don't do it. You don't have to do it, we'll, we'll, we'll get you better. But the, you can't, because two hours later she'd be off.
By the evening of Monday, the 11th of December, a massive manhunt was underway across Ipswich for the two missing women, and police were now forcing working girls off the street for their own safety. It was happening too fast. If a girl went missing for like 10 minutes, if you hadn't seen them, you'd be like, where are they, where are they? That's how it got. You'd panic and ask the police if they'd seen them. These girls are being taken under the noses of the police, taken out of the smallest kind of domain a serial killer's ever operated on. We're talking hundreds of yards. The killer would have had eye-to-eye -eye contact with the police and the police would have had eye-to-eye -eye contact with the killer. It could not have been any other way. There was roadblocks, we were stopping every car. The police were telling us to think who could be doing this. It's got to be someone you know, but you, could, you don't think that someone that you're getting in a car with or you've known before could do this, because why hasn't it happened to me or someone else? We were taken unawares. It was just the speed with which this unravelled. It was happening so fast. We weren't sure where they were lifted off the street from. Was it from a house? Was it from a hotel? But these working girls don't need normal lifestyles. They don't work nine to five. They are transient, they are chaotic, and it, it just added to the confusion. Paula had been missing for two days now, and gradually the details of her last movements were beginning to emerge. I was one of the last ones to see Paula. It was about half a seven on that Sunday evening. She came in, she looked quite nice, she looked a bit tired. I told her to be careful and she left. The last words she said to me, I think, were that uh, I will take care of Mrs Wade, don't worry about me, and off she went. Later that night, Paula tried desperately to borrow money for drugs and failed. She told a friend she was going to risk the streets one more time. Then they walked out into the red light district together. I begged her not to go out, but she was a stubborn one. So I went out with her. I said, look, I'll be back in 15 minutes. I want to go to the garage. If you haven't picked up a punter by then, we'll go back and we'll forget about it. I saw a guy slow down by me when I got to the two phone boxes. He slowed down, stared at me. For a long time, felt very strange. I walked to the garage, when I walked back, she wasn't there. I waited up till seven o'clock in the morning and she never came back. Even to this day, I still have problems sleeping. But I suppose as time goes on, you just get on with your life. After one, two, three, there was panic. There was panic in the villages. There was panic in Ipswich. And then I'm on a walk home, minding my own business as you do. And then all of a sudden, there was a body about 12 feet away. I could see um, three quarters of the body. Um, I stood for a brief moment, got my mobile phone out and dialed 999. It was frightening. Is the killer still here? Is it him come driving at me in his car? I will, I will need you at some point to go, all right? At three o'clock on Tuesday the 12th of December, police arrived to confirm that Ivan Harrison had found the killer's fourth victim. I felt so helpless. You couldn't do anything. You just couldn't do anything at all. She's so soft and laid back, you could just flicker and she'd fall over. 
I was known as the boisterous, bossy sister, and Paula was the quiet, timid. Very mischievous, though. She always wanted to be a hairdresser. If someone was sitting asleep on a chair, they'd wake up, not entirely bald, but, you know, a good trim. I'd be like, you're not coming near me with a pair of scissors. I know she'd had a few runs in with a few dealers. She was hospitalised once after being attacked with a machete. And I said, that's a rough world that she's involved in. Hello, Vicky. How are you? We're all very nervous. <laughs> once she lost the children, she didn't want to help herself. When they were going through the process of adoption, Paula had to sign a form and she refused so many times. They're my children, I love them, I will get better, I need help. That's all she said, but she was just left to deal with it. So she relied on the drug to kill the pain, to forget. Heroin was her saviour, in a way. helicopter was flying over the scene, beaming back live images. I could see the body of one naked girl in undergrowth. And I think I looked away from the screen and I looked back. And I did a double take. It wasn't just one body, it was two, about 100 metres apart. The phone rang, and it was my sister-in-law. She said, Alice, have you got the news on? I phoned my mum. Then this man answered the phone, and I said, where's my mum? And he said, your mum's busy at the moment. Is that Alice? And I said, yeah, that is. I want to speak to my mum. There's been another body found. I say, I want my mum. And he said, Alice, I'm so sorry. There's two officers on the way to you. And at that point, I just sort of fell to bits. It was a dark day for us. Just utter disbelief, shock. This was now five bodies in ten days. You could almost cut the atmosphere in that press conference with a knife. I can confirm that this afternoon, Tuesday, December the 12th, two bodies have been found near Ipswich. This is breaking news and we're giving it to you as we get it. The natural assumption is that these are the two missing women, Annette Nichols, aged 29 years, and Paula Clinnell, aged 24. I remember hearing about Annette specifically. It was just hearing that she'd been left in the middle of a field. How we just left them there, you know? I had the best sunrise of my life with Annette. And that was my one day in my life I'll never forget. I decided that we was just going to come sunbathe on the beach under the World Bridge. So we came down, we found a rope swing on the way. You know, two girls in bikinis swinging off a rope swing, you know, running around on the sand, writing our names in the sand, paddling through mud. We just had a picnic, you know. Fizzy alco pops, you know, and sandwiches we bought from the garage. You know, and we came down and had the best day of my life, you know. She was, she was happy then, you know. It's like neither of us had a care in the world, you know. For one day, we weren't prostitutes, we weren't drug addicts, we were just Jade and Annette, you know. And that's what I won't forget. The last time I seen Paula was seven months before we identified her. And as I was walking up the street, this car was beeping. And then this person jumped out the back door and went, Oh my God, you don't even recognise your own sister. Her weight 
had just fell off her. She was not the proud Paula that I knew. And I was pregnant at the time. She said, you know, you're so lucky. Anyway, she said, um, where are you living? And I told a lie. She said, have you got a mobile number or a phone number? She said, I'll give you a call. So I gave her a false telephone number. She stroked my face and then gave me a hug and said, I'll see you later. If that was me in that position, you know, lost my children, heavy on drugs, Paula would be the first person to step in and say, look, you're coming with me. I don't think she'd ever turn her back on me. And that's the guilt that I live with now. I did turn my back, and that's the worst thing i done as a sister, I think. Mm-hmm. Not in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I'd ever find myself faced with these circumstances. We did feel overwhelmed, um, both emotionally um, and uh, and physically. Um, you know, this just this, it, this just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen here in Suffolk. It doesn't happen anywhere. Officers and specialist support staff. The killing of five women in ten days was unprecedented in Britain. 300 officers from across the country were now dispatched to join the biggest manhunt for 30 years. The pressure on police to produce a suspect was intense. No one had yet been formally interviewed. No vehicles had been seized. The press were openly suggesting the investigation was stalled. I wasn't going to be pinned down to a clear number of suspects. There were a number of interesting individuals that we had on our radar. Lots of punters, lots of curb crawlers, drug dealers, partners. You know, this wasn't just one murder, this was five. From my perspective as a pathologist, obviously there was a lot of pressure to continue to collect best evidence because that might not only solve this murder, but would stand some chance of taking a serial offender off the streets. At the time, that I was investigating the last case, we still hadn't solved the first case. And so this looked like a tightening spiral of more and more discoveries of dead women in this area and, and no offender in custody. Evidence from the murder scene was being rushed to the Forensic Science Laboratory in nearby Huntingdon. Three bodies had now been found on dry land. If DNA could be recovered from any of them, it could be fed into the DNA database. And if that profile found a match, the police would have a name for the killer still at large. The main feeling was disbelief. The villagers around, the atmosphere, especially where the women were concerned, was fear. You know, they were frightened to go out. Frightened of talking to people. Everybody was just in shock. There was nobody much about at all. Very quiet. Most people just staying indoors. They were so frightened to come out. There was a lot of females on the street, and I don't open late, but there wasn't. It was a deadly sort of silence about it all. Very quiet hush over the town. The police seemed to take a while, I think, before they pinpointed anything or anybody. So that made people very nervous and frightened, I think. All the women in Ipswich were buying alarms. It just went to mayhem because the police thought he might start going after girls walking back from nightclubs. So women got scared thinking they were going to be next. As soon as Annette went missing and a body was found, I packed it in. There's a lot of media attention, so you couldn't work even if you wanted to. You'd see them all there with the cameras. I just thought, well, you know, now's the time to pack it in and... I did. Um, I'm glad I did, actually. The parents of the five victims were now trapped in the spotlight of a crime unfolding live on television. Here we were, embroiled in a huge event, <laughs> tragedy, that just got worse and worse 
and worse as, as time went on. We had absolutely no control over anything anymore. Referring to the young women as prostitutes, every time that word was used on the news, it was like a, a knife through the heart. We just wanted her to be known as our daughter because that's what she was. It was as if the whole world wanted to just... Um, pick at everything for the sake of vicarious thrills during the most devastating, appalling thing that could ever happen. And nobody cared when they were alive. Nobody cared when there were so many committed people all around Ipswich trying to say, these are the lives they're living in, this is how they're being exploited, and nobody could have given a flying fuck, but the moment they're dead, suddenly they all want their moment in the spotlight. Everybody just wanted to be involved after it was too late, and... And it was too late. Six days after the discovery of Paula and Annette, on Monday the 18th of December, police made their first arrest. The man was a regular in the red light district. Though he denied any involvement in the killings, Tom Stevens told a Sunday newspaper he knew all five of the dead women. But the previous evening, the police had also received another lead. It came in a call from the Forensic Science Laboratory. They had found DNA, and it had a match in the database. They had a name. The week had been crazy. 7 p.m. Some of our team sidled up and said, Stuart, we've got something to tell you that you're probably going to be interested in. I got told that we'd got a DNA profile, not just off one of the girls, but off two. And it wasn't who I expected it was going to be. On Tuesday, the 19th of December, 17 days after the first body was discovered, police in Ipswich arrested a second suspect. His DNA had been found on two of the five murdered women. He was in the DNA database for stealing 80 pounds three years earlier. His name was Steve Wright. He answered the door, he was arrested, and immediately became unsteady on his feet. He was sweating, very nervous, very uncomfortable with the circumstances. Wright was in the system. He was on our radar. He wasn't high on our radar. He lived in the red light district, so he would have been subject to a house-to-house -house inquiry. He was also on our radar as far as curb crawlers and punters was concerned. So he was there, he was in the system, and I think we would have got to him. Do you need to tell us what was going through your mind at the time? Do you need to tell us what's going through your mind now? And how you feel about it now? No comment. With a deadline to charge or release him, the race to uncover who Wright was began. And now they had a name. The details came flooding in. Stephen Wright was a forklift truck driver. He'd been married twice, he drove a Ford Mondeo Mark III. During the killings, police had stopped him twice and warned him for curb crawling. He was in a police station presenting his license two hours after the discovery of Gemma Adams. Then, CCTV analysts said they could identify a vehicle seen in the red light district on the night of one of the murders. It was a dark blue Ford Mondeo Mark III. they felt confident that they could identify Steve Wright's vehicle in the red light district on the night that Annalee Alderton went missing and were able to identify what appeared to be something hanging from the area of the interior mirror. 
When Wright's car was searched, a Christmas tree was found hanging from the rearview mirror in exactly that position. Then, with the deadline to release him fast approaching, one more piece of information came their way. Whilst he was in custody, we got a call from the Forensic Science Service who said, we've now got a link to a third victim. That information is absolutely critical. We've now got DNA on three of our victims that are linked to Steve Wright. We've got the last girl to go missing with your DNA and the one before with your DNA, both on their naked bodies. How can that be? No comment. On December the 21st, seven weeks after the first victim was killed, the only other suspect, Tom Stevens, was released and Wright was charged with the murder of all five women. In his interviews and at his trial, he never offered any explanation for the evidence put to him. The foreman stood up and the question was asked, how do you find the defendant, Steve Wright? And he said, guilty. And we were like, there was just massive sighs, there were sobs. The only time you could see him was as the judge was leaving the room. I just looked to my right and he was just there. And I was like, yeah, you look into my eyes and you know who I am because I'm not frightened of you. Steve Wright was so quiet, I wouldn't have suspected him for a minute. At the time, he was seeing other girls like me and a few of us, and he was just like a regular punter. He just, you know, he wasn't violent, he wasn't nasty, and he was just normal, really. In those seven weeks of 2006, five of the 30 working girls of Ipswich were killed. For those that remain, there is now more help than before. Many are under the care of a drug clinic that had been trying for years to raise the funds to fight the invasion of crack and heroin. were completely being blocked. Yeah, I mean, there, the, the way I see it, I, I was not literally a robot, but, you know, I wasn't feeling anything, you know. No. I was... That's how I wanted it. I didn't mm. want mm. to feel anything. I didn't want to... I used to want a perfect husband, 2.4 children, and I wanted a white picket fence and a walk-in closet. All I dream now is that I'm just not an addict anymore. Here is a um, place I came on my own one day, and um, when I decided that was it, you know... I'd had enough. I was never going to touch crack cocaine again. I threw my pipe into this river. Yeah, it's a good place to be. It's very... Do you know what? I feel like I'm able to do things here, which is a good thing, you know? You feel like anything's possible. I stood about here, and I just threw it as far and as hard as I could throw it. It's in the bottom there. Do you know what? And I don't want it back. It can stay where it is, because my life's going to get better now. Okay. I'm doing this for me this time, and I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I asked to be moved away from Ipswich so I could start afresh. My children have been adopted out. I've gave the person the address, so if they ever need to find me, they know where to find me. When they're old enough, if they come looking for me, if they know what I've done in the past, I'd like to be the one to explain to them why I did it. My sister always lived life 100%, constantly flickering and changing. But when it went out of control, she was as intensively self-destructive as she was when she celebrated life. When she was killed, I felt very defeated. Everything I'd fought and railed against in Ipswich for years had taken my sister. The only thing that made this exceptional and big national news was volume. 
And for it was so many in such a short space of time. Steve Wright did it because he was a sick fuck and the world's full of them. Um, it's how could he do it? How was he able to go out on the streets of a quiet town and get away with it? And how it became such a day-to-day -day part of life, driving around Ipswich, that nobody questions seeing these girls out there anymore, or um, the desperation that drives them to it. We don't want to acknowledge the problems in our street. We don't want to acknowledge the problems on the corner. But you can't turn a blind eye. If it can happen in Ipswich, it can happen in any small town. For more information on the issues raised in the programme and an exclusive interview with the director, go to channel4.com slash cutting edge. Well, on Sunday, Anne Widdicombe explores Western Europe during the Reformation in our groundbreaking series, Christianity, a History at Seven. <laughs>